Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Faces of Next Gen Live. I'm your host, Eric Wells. I am the education coordinator for the Next Gen Genealogy Network, and we encourage young genealogists uh, in, to enter the field of genealogy. And on this show, we talk to genealogists all over the world, um, and uh, both young and old. And uh, I am really excited today to interview and talk to and get to know one of my favorite people, George Morgan. George, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. What about you? I'm doing pretty darn good. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great day, and it's it's even better now that I get to sit down with you. Uh, now, um, I've known you through Drew for a little yeah. while, but actually the first time you and I met was at uh, Jamboree uh, last year in, in, San, or in uh, Burbank. Yep. And uh, you you gave a couple of talks in talks. In fact, um, that's one of the things that you kind of love to do is is uh, training and teaching. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. And you've got your own company called the Aha, Aha Seminars. Seminars Inc. And where'd you come up with that name? Um, well, we wanted to use. Uh, we were looking for for a catchy name for the for the company, and. Uh, I kind of liked Eureka, but that was taken, right? And it had to do with a vacuum cleaner, and I didn't think that was probably a good idea. But uh, uh, we talk about, uh, I want people, when, when they attend one of our seminars or one of my seminars, uh, I want them to have aha moments where they think, ah, I can use that. Oh, I didn't know that. Let's... Uh, let me jot that down. Let me remember that. And the whole idea of doing training is to obviously impart information. But on the other hand, I'll tell you that when I'm doing seminars uh, with uh, live seminars with people, I'm learning as much from them as they are from me. The two way exchange is, is just amazing. Yeah. You know, I can uh, really uh, empathize with that because it's the same thing for me. I love, uh, when, when I give talks, um, I love standing in front of the people and looking at their faces and then have people's eyes light up when they get it or, or when they get excited about something. Uh, and, it, and, um, and looking at that, I kind of am able to uh, adjust or, or focus on or tweak um, the way that I uh, present. So I'm learning quite a bit, too, as well. And also talking about it helps just to reinforce um, and uh, relearn uh, the, the stuff that I'm talking about, too. I'll tell you, there's, there is not a, a seminar that I give that is the same every single time. It's not like I'm reciting something from rote. What I'm really doing is, is adjusting to the audience and what the response is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to do that. You can't just get up and say, "I know it all," and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mm -hmm. throw this out to you. You have to, you have to kind of understand uh, where your audience has come from. And it's not unusual when I start a presentation, I'll say, "You know, how long have you been doing genealogy?" You know, and raise your hand. Have you been doing genealogy six months, a year, five years, ten years, twenty years, mm -hmm. whatever? And uh, uh, or I'll start talking about DNA and say, uh, do any of you have a DNA? Or, <laughs> or I'll be talking, talking about ship's passenger list and say, does anybody here have uh, uh, immigrant ancestors? And look around, you know. And it, uh, you know, it kind of lightens some of it and sets the stage, but, but it also gives me an opportunity to gauge the audience and, and what their, uh, uh, what their, interest level is or knowledge level and and that helps yeah yeah i like that too it's um i like it more of a classroom type of situation where people can ask questions if, if they something comes up and um uh because i really want them to get and want them to walk away with something uh, and i don't want them to waste their time or it feels like i'm wasting my time that's right well, George, I'm going to ask one of the first questions here, and it's one of the hardest for me to ask because it's like the social uh, <laughs> people don't like this question, but what is your age? How old are you? Uh, 32. 32? <laughs> no. No, actually, I turned 65 last year. You don't look a day over 32. And I don't dye the hair. <laughs> really? 
<laughs> yeah, I have a I have a friend who every time she sees me, she says, "All right," she said, "Let me check the gray." She said, uh, "What uh, what flavor of uh, just for men are you are you using?" But and, uh, it, and it's not like, "Oh, would you like to try my hair on?" And you take off because uh, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, I'm 65, and I and uh, I, I think it's it, first of all I want to know how the hell I got to this age, but on the <laughs> other hand, you know, I, I think back to the things that I've lived through and things that I've seen, um, the technology that I've seen uh, show up over the years. I mean, when I was growing up, we played with sticks, you know, <laughs> and kids have Ataris and so forth, and they're playing on their phones, but. Uh, I saw a fascinating video not long ago where uh, a, a parent had had shown their their teenage kids uh, a rotary dial telephone and asked <laughs> how it worked. It was the funniest thing I'd seen in a long time, <laughs> and they weren't sure; they just didn't know. Now, I uh, one of the things that really uh, fascinated me about you was kind of your your the job that you did, the work that you did in the past. Yeah. And you want to talk a little bit about that, like before you became a genealogist? Well, I've been a genealogist forever and ever, but but from an occupational standpoint, um, I've been involved in the data processing environment since, I don't know, since, since the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, I was I was pulled in, I worked with a merchandiser in Chicago um that you might remember montgomery ward yes we called him monkey ward yeah monkey box we called him monkey box because uh uh montgomery ward and container corporation were both uh bought by um uh, mobile oil and uh they both failed but um but one of the what we were doing at uh uh at montgomery ward is we were we were computerizing all the information about every single item number, uh, both oh, from wow. the catalog side and the retail side. And we were doing automatic uh, replenishment based on, on sales. Mm -hmm. uh, an item sells, uh, the sales report comes back and it's reordered and replenished. But ultimately that led to um, uh, an upgrade to what we called electronic data interchange the uh, electronic purchase orders, invoices, shipping notices, and so forth for every one of, uh, uh, of those items. Well, ultimately, Montgomery Ward uh, folded, and uh, I went from there to, uh, to Sears. And, uh, since, and Sears had not gotten to that point in time. They had an old proprietary ordering system, but I started working with them and helped them build their EDI program. And uh, within a year and a half, we had the, the top of 600 by, by volume of sales, the top 600 vendors uh, for Sears on this EDI program. And then we went on to, to roll that out more and more. But part of what that involved uh, for us was was building the training materials mm -hmm. and bringing the vendors in, bringing the people in, and working with them to to show them what EDI was, to train them, and then give them something to take back to begin the testing process. And we had a whole team that did that testing, but mm -hmm. the training process. I mean, we did a lot of that at the uh, corporate headquarters at Sears Tower, um, uh, and uh, later on, it became a process of taking that training out on the road. And it wasn't just purchase orders and invoices, it was all kinds of things. Uh, Sears is involved in, in parts and service as, as they still are today. Mm -hmm. um, the automobile service um, centers uh, and a whole lot of different things. So I, I came up in the corporate training area and was one of the corporate training managers uh, for the Sears Corporation. And I loved it. And then ultimately, that uh, what we were doing became part of a joint venture with um, uh, IBM. Sears at the time was IBM's largest customer worldwide for computer equipment, and they wanted to get involved in the EDI business. So 
uh, our group at Sears became part of an IBM joint venture and ultimately uh, became a separate company uh, under IBM. Oh, wow. and, uh, uh, and still that involved training and so forth. Um, and uh, we also put on customer conferences for IBM and we would bring in the top 500 customers of the IBM corporation from all over the world and their spouse or significant other. We'd bring them into some resort, um, like uh, we took them to San Diego one year, we took them to Disney World one year, we took over the Dolphin and Swan Hotels, uh, and, and we gave them seminars, we gave them training, we entertained them, we gave them cocktail parties, um, and, and the whole idea of putting together uh, this kind of training was, was just great. And so I did, uh, I did that for a number of years. And ultimately, um, uh, when IBM moved me to Tampa, I stayed here, stayed working with the company for about a year. And I thought in the meantime, you know, I'd really like to start my own seminar company. And uh, what I would like to do is help libraries and librarians uh, become more computer literate. And that was right about the same time, Eric, as um, libraries were replacing dumb terminals with PCs and beginning to, to uh, bring the internet in. So that was a great training opportunity. But in the meantime, I'd been doing genealogy for so many years, it was just a natural to, uh, to offer genealogy services genealogy training. So I was doing that for societies, for libraries, and for, for different organizations. So that's my training background. And so you were kind of on the, the, uh, the, the cutting edge of, of uh, the whole program, the software for um, uh, invoicing and inventory and, uh, and things like that. And then also cataloging in a sense yeah. for libraries. And that's, that's oh, an yeah. uh, impressive resume. The guy that uh, uh, the guy who I admired more uh, in the EDI arena than anyone else was a fellow by the name of Ed Gilbert, and Ed was in his mid to late seventies uh, at the um, uh, in the eighties, and uh, uh, you think, well, what has this guy got, got to do with EDI? This is the man who organized the Berlin Airlift after World <laughs> War II. And so you think about the commodities, just the sheer quantity of food and and blankets and all kinds of things. He yeah. knew how to do it, and he developed the prototype for all of it. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, that was because yeah, they they just dropped tons and tons and tons of stuff uh, into Berlin uh, over. Uh, span of a few years it was fabulous and I, I, i'd love to sit and listen to him tell the stories yeah fascinating well, let's get back to genealogy a little bit um uh, it sounds like you became interested in genealogy at a young age you want to tell me about that yeah i did um my my father's uh, father died about six months after i was born and uh my grandmother and her daughter, my brother's, my father's sister, they lived together uh, all those years. And my grandmother was born in 1873, and she died in 1966. Um, but um, in in January of 62, she she kind of took me onto the side, and she said, "You know, you're the last grandchild." you are going to learn about our Revolutionary <laughs> War ancestors. You are going to learn. And she, we spent, a, a, spent several days, she was a pack rat. She and my grandfather had lost everything in the depression, uh, literally everything. Wow. Um, but she had boxes of papers and she, had, she still had them in the house and old Bibles, lots of different things. And so uh, we spent several days at this, this drop leaf table uh, in the living room with uh, uh, brown parcel paper and a ruler and pencils and pens. And we literally drew a family tree. Oh, wow. And, and she would tell me stories about, you know, she was the youngest of 11. And uh, she would tell me about her brothers and her sisters and, 
and her parents and what it was like when she grew, was growing up. And she'd say every once in a while, now go get your, go get your grandfather's Bible. We're going to add that in. Or she'd say, go over to that uh, cabinet there in the bottom drawer. There's some boxes uh, with some papers. And yeah, there were deeds and wills and old Bibles and all kinds of great stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just, it, it piqued my interest and I thought this was really fun. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how I really got started. She was on a, a mission uh, to make sure that this uh, interest went forward and yep. uh, the work that she had done and the heritage she had collected um, uh, would, would go on in the future. And she was, uh, she was very proud of her, her heritage and her background. Um, she, was, uh, she was the youngest daughter of a physician. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy was worth a lot of money uh, at the time. And he and his wife did uh, philanthropic work in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, Mecklenburg County. And then her grandfather uh, was also a physician. And he was very well documented. He was so progressive. How progressive was he? <laughs> he was so progressive. He did not believe in cupping to bleed people. <laughs> He, he was into them newfangled leeches. <laughs> but I found out that, that her father, her father, as I said, was a doctor. He went to the, the medical school of Charleston in 1854 Jeez. in one year, and he learned everything. And that was his medical training. Wow. The difference is now. Yeah, they have to go through uh, years and years of training and residency in order just to be a doctor. Yeah. But, so, I, but I would love, uh, my grandmother would tell stories about what it was like when, when she was a little girl um, and, and what it was like to, to go into town uh, in, in a carriage or, or go to church or, or whatever. And uh, she, rem she remembered a lot of, uh, of historical things and she was happy to share. That generation um, fascinates me, just the, the um, bridging the gap between not only just like horse and buggy and uh, automobiles, which was just a quantum leap in transportation, but also uh, how warfare was conducted from uh, the Civil War era type swords and, and, and guns to uh, World War I era tanks and machine guns and airplanes and World War II, uh, and then even from the Depression in the 30s to um, uh, the, the, how much stuff we had coming out of the war. Uh, it, it just, it's, it's impressive. To, 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 I wish that we could still kind of talk to some of those people who did bridge that, that gap. Well, one, of, one of my great regrets is I didn't have a tape recorder mm -hmm. uh, with her. She, as I said, she was born in January of 1873. She died in December of 66. And one of the things she wanted to see more than anything else was a man land on the moon. Oh, wow. She missed it by three years. Yeah. Yeah. And she just she just thought that that was tremendous. Yeah, <laughs> that is really cool. From horse and buggy to man on the moon. Come on, that's amazing. I actually call it from outhouse, right? <laughs> because they, they didn't have, they didn't have inside yeah. plumbing. Yeah, and they. <laughs> So um, talking about ancestors and stuff, who would be one of the ancestors that you'd want to meet the most? Oh, I, I have a favorite ancestor, and that's uh, uh, one of my great-grandfathers. And uh, he is my mother's mother's father. His name was Greenberry Holder. And uh, he married, uh, he married a, a nice girl. Uh, uh, her name was Ansibel Penelope Swords. A Whoa, what a name. Yeah. Ansibel? Ansibel. I've always liked Penelope, and then her last name was Swords. Swords. Now, imagine me trying to do research on the internet. I'm looking for holders, and I'm looking for swords. <laughs> you know, it's almost like Smith and Jones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm so interested in him, um, he was born in 1843. He, he uh, 
uh, enlisted in the Confederate Army along with his older brother, and uh, they fought through the Civil War. They were both at Appomattox uh, mm -hmm. when Lee surrendered, and they walked back to Georgia. Um, and uh, they picked up from where they where their their parents were, and the four of them moved farther west uh, into northwest Georgia into Floyd County. Um, and uh, he was a fascinating guy. Um, he was a real entrepreneur. Um, he had great ideas for for making money. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, he was a farmer. Uh, the farmland that he bought um, had a cave on it. Oh, wow. What lives in caves? Bears. Bats. bats. What do bats produce? Poop. Guano. And guano is used in fertilizer. So he's, he took advantage of that and started the North Georgia Fertilizer Company. You're kidding me. Nope. And, uh, and that was in, in 1872, if I recall. Do you know it? And he sold it in 1891. He sold it in 1891 for $200,000. What? In $1891? Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Did he know when he bought the land? Do you know if he knew that the cave was on it? No, apparently not. Okay, so it was just kind but, of a windfall. Uh, um, but he did other things too. He he opened a uh, a general store mm -hmm. and uh, uh, on the edge of his property, and he was the first postmaster appointed for that little community called Lindale. And uh, I've done research on uh, the post office records. And in fact, uh, I've got a, an article coming up in the APG, APG Quarterly uh, about post office records and how they can add context to your, uh, to your ancestors. Not just you know, whether they were postmasters or not, but just about the community itself. Sure. But uh, he did those things. He was... He served two non-consecutive terms in the Georgia State Legislature. Um, he started a mercantile uh, company in the town of Rome. He did. Uh, wow. Uh, he was investing in real estate, uh, and it was it was just fascinating. Um, now I, I'm kind of assuming, right? Because I don't really know. Uh, in, in about that time period. Um, would the post office typically be in a general store? It could be. Yeah. And so it was not unusual. It could have been in a house. It uh -huh. could have been in a general store, could have been in a railway office. It could have been anywhere. Um, the idea was, was to establish a, a mail service, a postal service in uh, to serve as much of the community as possible. And people were, were, People were recruited and people volunteered because, hey, just by handling handling the mail, they were getting uh, they were getting paid by the federal government. And it sounds uh, like uh, the, the, your ancestor, um, what was his name again? Greenberry Holder. Greenberry. It sounds like he was pretty darn smart. And if he also integrated a post office into his general store as the postmaster, when people came to get there letters they would probably walk out having bought something too and when mail that's right and when mail arrived uh in, in a place like that the the way you might let someone know is you tell their neighbor who comes into the store and the neighbor goes back and passes the word and says hey there's a letter waiting for you at yeah. uh, at uh, at holder's store and and then they would make the the effort to go to the store that would get him in there. So mm -hmm. he's no dummy. He's going to say, oh, gee, it's nice to see you. <laughs> oh, and I've got this new merchandise over here. I've, I've also seen them announce uh, who has letters waiting at the, the post office, too, in the newspapers. In the newspapers. Yeah. And, and I, I particularly like, like that clue, Eric, because that tells you that whether they were there in the community or not, mm -hmm. someone expected them to have been there. Yep. Yeah, I love going through all news, old newspapers. It's just fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, one, what uh, you've done a ton of research. What would be one of the most interesting or surprising discoveries that you've made? 
was with Greenberry. Was it? So the, the two? Had... Yeah, Greenberry had 12 children. Mm -hmm. There were 12 children and uh, six boys and six girls. And I made the decision uh, in 1998 that I was going to travel to Rome, Georgia, and learn everything about every one of those children I could and try to put them into place, find out when they were born, what church they were married in, where they died, where they were buried, and all that. So I started that, and I spent um, a week there in August of that year. And it was, it was a wonderful experience, and I, I planned it in advance, what my goals were, the places I wanted to visit, and, and all of that. But... Uh, uh, one of the children I couldn't find much at all on, and that was his son Green. Excuse me, Briscoe, Briscoe Holder, and the last some creative. The, uh, well, Briscoe was Briscoe was my uh, was my biggest brick wall for more than twenty years, and uh, the last record I could find in Rome was uh, a voter registration in nineteen six. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, World War I draft registrations had not been published online at Ancestry at the time. And so I kind of waited, and they came up state by state. Finally, I found that, and the World War registration was great because where did I find him? In Cerro Gordo County, Iowa. Now, I'm thinking, well, how did he get to Iowa? And, but I knew some uh, some family stories about about this guy, and the story was that he had died sometime in the mid 1920s in a place uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, one of them sea towns in the Midwest. <laughs> and so in 1920s, well, there are things you don't look for. But I looked through census records; I couldn't find anything. One of our podcast listeners uh, actually found, she found that uh, the state of Missouri the, um, uh, had published all of the death certificates in PDF format. Yes, yes. And uh, she had heard me talk about Briscoe on the podcast, and I'm looking for him, looking for him. And somehow, for some reason, she went and looked. She found a death certificate. And she sent it back. She sent it all. Uh, and you talk about sitting here sobbing <laughs> when I when I got it, and then doing the happy dance. And that was on a Saturday morning. So I couldn't wait until Monday because on the death certificate I've got two very important pieces of information. I've got the name of the funeral home and the name of the cemetery. Well, the other thing was it said the names of the parents. Mm -hmm. Father's name, Greenberry Holder. Mother's name, Elizabeth Ford. Huh? What? And I thought, well, uh, somebody just made a mistake. Somebody in the hospital made a mistake. So, but he didn't die in the mid-20s. He died in May of 1949. And so based on that, now I'm thinking, okay, well, there might be a 1930, a 1940 census record. 1940 wasn't out at that point, but uh, 1930. And then I realized, you know, I went looking and I couldn't find anything. And then I thought, hmm, 1949, if he was going to be employed anywhere, he had to have a social security number. Mm -hmm. So then I went back and I'm, I made a request for an SS5. Sure enough, got that. Father's name, Greenberry Holder. Mother's name, Elizabeth Ford. Whoa. Uh-uh. <laughs> and I said, uh, maybe the death certificate was not a mistake. So then I started looking. Uh, uh, at, at that point, I had already called the cemetery um, on the Monday morning after the, the thing came in and said, uh, uh, and the woman at the cemetery said, let me put you on hold and I'll pull the record. And she did. She came back and she said, well, there's not much here. But she said, <laughs> there's a receipt in the file for uh, a Western Union transfer of $100 from uh, a Mrs. Emma D. Holder. 
And I said, well, that that's great because that verified a family story that his sister could not afford to bring his body home for burial, but she sent money. Mm -hmm. And so that was great. So then I'm on the phone with the cemetery and the cemetery puts me on hold, comes back. Yes, he's here. He's in an unmarked grave. And the woman I talked to was very nice. She even went out that afternoon to the grave site and photographed the grass oh. and emailed it to me. Well, that was great. So, but, and I thought, well, that's not right. He needs to have a marked grave. So that was Monday. By Friday, I had called back and given her a credit card number and we placed an order for uh, a gravestone. Uh, the problem was that I couldn't think of uh, uh, an appropriate epitaph. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that to Drew, and Drew said, well, I've got one for you. I said, what's that? He said, how about never forgotten? <laughs> and I said, that's perfect. Uh, we've been looking for him for years. So that was right. So th uh, that, that grave is out there. That stone is out there. Um, it's just... But the thing that's interesting is I kept doing more research and I found there was an Elizabeth Ford in 1860 in, in, that, in that town and she was married to a Robert Ford and she, and she had a couple of children. In 1870, she's a widow. Oh. And the place that they lived was about four blocks away from where Greenberry and Ansebel Penelope lived. Oh my. <laughs> and so I can kind of envision this that, well, the other thing that I hadn't done, stupid me, in my genealogy software is sorted the children uh, by date of birth. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I found that the next oldest sister, the next old, oldest sibling was a sister, the one who sent the $100. And she was about 16 months older than he was. And then the next youngest child was another sister, and she was five months younger. Oh. oh. So now it all makes sense. Wow. This is an illegitimate child. So Greenberry had 12 children, and his wife had 11. And Greenberry obviously brought this child home and said, Honey, I have a present for you. I want you to raise this child for me. Mm. So, so something went wrong, and and Briscoe left, and uh, he never married, and you know, he and he he died alone in 1949. But the thing that was fascinating to me is, I knew that that Greenberry was an entrepreneur. He was a smart guy. He invested mm -hmm. well. Uh, he did a lot of interesting things and served in the community. Just did lots of those things. But then to turn at, turn around and say, "Oops." <laughs> you know, here's a little surprise, but, uh, but uh, that was really my, my first introduction in, in my research to, wait a minute, there's a lot of scandal in this family. So then I started looking for more. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome story. It's and fun. And it's, it's, fun. It's, it's kind of cool because you've injected yourself into the story as like one of the final chapters of... Uh, having a tombstone in his name put at the, the unmarked grave. That is that's beautiful. And one of my one of my bucket list items is to get out to St. Louis, out to the cemetery, and and visit that stone and see if I can get uh, my cousins to come along with. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be pretty darn cool. Did uh, did he have any children? Did uh, Briscoe have any children? Briscoe never married. Okay, at least not that I can find. So we, um, you mentioned, uh, and we haven't actually covered it, but um, the thing you're most well known for is your genealogy podcast. Yeah. And I would be hard pressed to uh, find anyone who's in the chat room right now who doesn't know that you have a podcast. But tell us about the podcast. Well, Drew and I decided uh, back in in 2005. We were fascinated by the idea of podcasts. And, and yeah, that was kind of a new thing back started. then. So we decided we were going to start a genealogy podcast. We were going to do it every two weeks. And so we started with the Genealogy Guys podcast. 
We are the oldest uh, genealogical podcast uh, in the world. And we've had, I don't know, something like two and a half to three million downloads <laughs> over all these years. But we were doing the Genealogy Guys podcast, which is news from the community, listener email. We do book reviews. We've done interviews. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, theories, about research. We have fun just, you know, extrapolating on, on what our experiences have been, thinking that maybe somebody else will listen and think, oh, that gives me an idea. But we get listener email that we respond to, and if we don't know the answers or we think, you know, our, our listeners can can expand on, on what we might say, we'll, we'll just open the floor up and say, send us an email. If you know something about this, please do. Uh, and there have been a lot of cases where people have, have sent additional tips in or additional resources, and we've put these people in connection with one another. And uh, in some cases, they've, they've become colleagues in research. In other cases, uh, we've gotten past some brick walls, and that to me is marvelous. And then we decided uh, we were going to expand, and we started another podcast in 2016, uh, genealogy connection, and since Drew has a perfect radio voice, uh, <laughs> he does. Well, he does. He does. Yeah, he used he to really be does. a radio reader uh, uh, for uh, PBS, <laughs> but uh, 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 he does interviews with with people all over the world uh, in genealogy, whether they're speakers, authors, um, software developers. Uh, entrepreneurs of any sort, and th those have been very, very popular. And uh, um, just in case someone, whoever is watching, is has not ever heard of your podcast, which I would highly doubt, um, it's, you can find uh, genealogy guys on the web and on Facebook and all over the place. Yeah, uh, we have a web book, uh, a web page at, at genealogyguys.com. The podcasts are free. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we publish these things for the genealogy guys. Every episode has show notes, so you can, you can search uh, for a topic if you're looking for, for German research or, or Swedish or, what, or African American, whatever. Just uh, get in the search box. Um, but uh, the idea was, is, is to make these things free and, uh, and keep them free. We have some great sponsors, and uh, um, I, I won't promote them here, but but you'll see those at, at uh, the website. We also have a Facebook page, and uh, we announce new episodes of the podcast and, uh, and other information. We've got a lot of people in the chat room, and uh, one of them who is especially geeking out, Margaret Eves, says that uh, she really loves the new music uh, since the 10th anniversary. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were. Uh, we really liked that too. Um, um, at one point, er, early on, we had uh, we had a calico cat named Fletcher, and Fletcher would sit on in on the podcast and would uh, would speak, and we'd ask Fletcher, "What's your opinion of this book? <laughs> what do you think?" <laughs> I want you to know that Fletcher had her own fan club. <laughs> There were people who would send us email and say, my cat listens to your cat. <laughs> or Fletcher has some really interesting things to say. Um, unfortunately, we, we lost Fletcher a number of years ago, but uh, people would come up to us in the airport and, you know, and say hello. and I love your podcast. Say hi to Fletcher for me. Aww. It was neat. The Fletcher fan club. That's, that's so cool. <laughs> Hey, why not? <laughs> I love it. So when you're doing your research, what is one of the, um, the places that, that you feel you love doing it at? Uh, like uh, where, where do you get the most kind of work done? I spend a lot of time in libraries. And unfortunately, I, th I, I think people have become too dependent on the online sources. Yeah. And they don't—they um, don't believe that necessarily the uh, 
uh, libraries and archives have a lot to offer when in fact that's where the majority of the materials are. Right. Um, and while lots of things are being digitized and certainly we're seeing family search come along with they're digitizing the records that they've had on microfilm and they're gathering new records. Uh, there are other websites that, that help us as well, but I still go back to libraries and archives. Mm -hmm. And I'm always concerned when I go to a, let's say a commercial genealogy site and I see, I see a record there or I see an index or transcription especially. And then there will be a description of the collection and it'll tell me this is where where the original materials are. I have spent so much time over the years, I use uh, kind of a, uh, a template form letter and fill in the blanks and send it off. I'm always looking for the original records yeah. so that I can see them for myself and I don't take anybody else's word for it. There are lots of books of transcriptions that, that have been published uh, uh, in the last century and you know, I'll go through those and, and I'll see indexes or, or I'll see the transcriptions or I'll see the abstracts or extracts and I think, well, that's great, but I wanna see more. And uh, I've spent a lot of money on, uh, uh, on original copies of documents and that's great too. I love this, this era, Eric, we're in a golden age of genealogy. We have so much coming up online all the time. Uh, certainly what Family Search is doing is great. Um, we have to understand that not everything is gonna go up online with uh, uh, indexed for searchability. We have, still have to browse, but, but that, that's a great feature. Um, Ancestry.com is uh, the largest advertiser of all of the commercial services. Uh, I don't see them adding uh, anywhere near as much content as, as they did in the past. The service that, that I see really excelling in that area is MyHeritage. MyHeritage is just, it, it, it's swelling. There's so much stuff going in. Mm -hmm. And they're becoming leaders in the um, in the DNA arena too. They're, they're adding more technology at my heritage. Uh, it seems like every couple of months they're busy. Yeah. Um, going back a little bit to what you're saying, uh, that not everything is online. I completely agree with you. There's been, uh, I haven't been doing genealogy, uh, as nearly as long as, uh, you or many other people, but two cases that I've been working on, um, this, the brick walls would not have been uh, knocked down had I not gone to the courthouses. There just was nothing online to connect, uh, to, to, to uh, refute or um, support the, the hypothesis. And, it, and right. it took going to the courthouse, going to the archives, going to the library to solve that problem. So uh, I'm a big proponent of doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that I recommend to, to anybody doing genealogy is context. Put your ancestor into context. Mm -hmm. uh, find out where they were at every census and, and any kind of documentation you've got in between newspapers, uh, uh, any kind of, of public records. Michael Lacopo is one of my idols as a speaker. Uh, He's, he's just brilliant. Uh, we saw him do, uh, he did a webinar for our local society about a year ago, uh, which talked about in between the censuses. He said, you see your ancestor here in a census, you see him 10 years later here in the census, and that may be in the same community, but unless you pay really close attention to addresses and, and, or, or whatever, your ancestor may have left there and gone someplace else. They may have migrated elsewhere and then come back. You don't know unless you start uh, doing the research and looking carefully at, uh, um, at what they were doing in right. between these census years. And that means looking at city directories, looking at tax rolls, looking at all sorts of things. For me, if I, anytime I find, you know, a little snippet about uh, one of my family members, 
I gather it, I clip it, I, I, I cite it so that I can come back to it again and, and ultimately kind of collate it all into chronological sequence and see what does it tell me. Right. It's uh, like watching I'm, biography on A and E at one point. <laughs> I want I film. I, I love the city directories, to be honest with you. It just, it's a, a tiny little uh, mention of your ancestor, but it has so much information. It has like who was married, whether the, the husband was widowed or not, it has the address and the occupation in it. It's just, uh, um, it, and sometimes even the name of the company that they're working for. Yes. About. Uh, it, it, I, I have just been always amazed at how concentrated the, uh, the information you can get out of it is. And, and some people don't recognize or, or, or don't understand that, that some of those city directories not only have an alphabetical listing, but they also have a geographic listing of the people in sequence as they live. And yes. that's kind of fun too. Yeah, like in the back of it, they'll have the, the addre addresses and cross streets, and uh, you could see the neighbors who lived right around them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cool. All right. Elizabeth well, Sean Mills did a, did a great seminar a uh, number of years ago talking about the census enumerators, and she said, people told us at one point, when you look at census records, look at families, six on this side and six on that side of where your ancestors were, and keep track of that. And she said, I'm here to tell you that the census enumerator didn't just go down one road all the way and down one road the other way, that they went down, they turned the corner, they went back, and they went in a zigzag pattern. So, so instead of six families, you may find that the 14th family was the family who lived behind your ancestors. Yep. And that may be the family that they married into. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of uh, the enumerator uh, kind of had a drunken walk every now and then, just zigzag around, and uh, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yep. <laughs> so, um, what kind of books do you like reading? Like, what are some of your favorite books, whether it's genealogy or not? There are a lot of. I have a lot of favorite genealogy books, um, and uh, uh, I certainly there. There's some that I keep keep within uh, within reach here. Certainly one that I, uh, I deal with all the time is, uh, is Ancestry Red Book and The Source, but I also look at, uh, at other books. There's one called Place Names of Long Ago, which was based on the 1890 census, um, and it's a gazetteer, and that, that, that's a helpful book. Those are those are those are great resources. I love maps, and mm -hmm. we've got loads of map books here. Um, uh, county histories, state histories. I just finished a book uh, not long ago. Um, our friend Paul Hawthorne out in California had mentioned that uh, he had read uh, uh, a, a book about uh, Alabama history. And so I, as soon as I saw it, I ordered it because I have Alabama ancestors and got the book and I've, I've just been reading it and pouring over it. So that's fun too. Um, my, my reading outside of genealogy is pretty eclectic. Um, I like crime mysteries. Um, I have uh, a new favorite uh, mystery author and that's uh, Nathan Dylan Goodwin. Yeah. Uh, do you know Nathan? No, what kind of stuff is uh, Nathan is based in England. Uh, the southeast portion of England. He's a, a historian. He knows all about oh the Battle of Hastings and a lot about World War II. Uh, but he also has created a character by the name of Morton Farrier, uh, the forensic genealogist. Oh, my oh, gosh. and oh, there's just so many things, so many books, and he's just out with a brand new one that he was selling at Roots Tech. Uh, but um, he took seven suitcases of books to Roots Tech, and I think he brought back a, you know, a very small number of books. Uh, but his name is Nathan Dylan Goodwin, and uh, his stuff is just amazing. He's a great author. But I, like, uh, I also like to read biographies of, of famous people. Um, 
historical people, movie stars. Uh, I love uh, the old movies from the silent movie era up mm -hmm. through about 1950, the mid 50s. Uh, those are those are just fabulous films. Um, I love the music from that same time period. Um, I just did an article for um, uh, Internet Genealogy magazine talking uh, called "That's Entertainment," and that talked about how our our ancestors were entertained, going to films, going to dances, uh, and I found literally scores of uh, YouTube links showing film clips, uh, uh, some of the bands from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, uh, the dances like the Charleston or the Black Bottom or, uh, or the Jitterbug, and just, I, I love those that kind of music, um, as well as, classical music and opera. It's just great stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, you, uh, we talked a little bit about opera just uh, privately, and um, I'm um, getting more and more into it, to be honest with you. <laughs> so um, do, you take, uh, do you take on genealogy clients? I really don't. I mean, I, I, I like to help people uh, kind of pro bono, but uh, uh, I don't take on clients. I mean, between, uh, between what what I do with seminars, what I do with uh, with writing, uh, with the podcast, and with uh, with some other things, I just don't have the time to do it. Sure. Um, when you first started, when you first sat down with your grandma and you started to learn about your uh, genealogy, what was uh, if you could go back and talk to that younger George? What would be something that you would tell tell him? Cite your sources. <laughs> Cite um, your sources. And and I and I was dumb. I was connect just collecting names and places and dates, and uh, and I was listening to the stories that that I was being told, uh, and building that c context in my mind. Sure. Um, if I had it all to do over again, I would have cited sources. Mm -hmm. I would have uh, recorded more information. I'd have found a tape recorder somehow. Um, but uh, uh, anyone getting started these these days, it it really is important. Um, it's not just busy work. This this source citing business. It's just not busy work. It's it, it's a way to retrace your your research path, and also to share it with other people. Uh, to give them some idea of of what you found, where you found it, so that they could go back and look at it themselves. Right. And citing the sources is kind of tough at first, but then it gets more and more easier. It gets more and more easy as uh, you do it more and more. Well, we certainly learned how to how to do uh, citations, footnotes, and uh, bibliographic citations when we did term papers. Yeah. And, and I always thought those were a pain in the neck, but uh, uh, my mother was a, 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 a private secretary, um, an executive secretary, and she, she, she would help me uh, understand how to format these things. And she said, there really is an order to it. And she said, it's, it's like putting everything in a particular pattern so you always know where to look for it. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's true. But then you look at you know, Elizabeth Schoen Mill's book, Evidence Explained, and you think to just to scan through it the first time, oh, there's no rhyme or reason to this. <laughs> that is emphatically not true. Right. Um, but uh, uh, those source citations are very important. I've got a question here from Margaret Eaves, and she asks, do you have any idea about finding how to find audio recordings of your ancestors in uh, various archives? I think you have to, well, let me tell you, first of all, that audio recordings uh, have become more and more common in terms of, of oral histories. Uh, and they have been more formally sought after and, and, and recorded and then made available. 
and some of them online. But the, the problem that we have uh, is that the, the ones that exist, the ones that maybe were done um, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 75 years ago, uh, the, the libraries or archives are, are, are concerned about ownership. Mm. Uh, whether it was uh, whether they have the the right to publish something, mm. and really? in many cases, I know uh, that there are libraries. For instance, there's one in there's a library over in Vero Beach, Florida, and uh, they have collected a huge number of these audio recordings, but they uh, they couldn't do anything with them except preserve them. People would come into the library and maybe listen to them, but they couldn't catalog them. They couldn't. Uh, uh, they couldn't advertise their availability. They couldn't put them online uh, because they didn't have authorization uh, from the person uh, whose recording it was or the heirs. And so, in many cases, they were going back playing catch up. What I would suggest, uh, if you were looking for the possibility of audio recordings of, um, of your family members uh, go back to the public libraries and the uh, academic libraries and the historical and genealogical societies in the area around where they live. And I'm not just saying in the one county, but look in surrounding counties as well. Uh, ask the questions. Um, sometimes you, you, you will talk to a librarian who will say, talk to this person at our main library. They know more about what we have in the way of audio recordings uh, in our possession. And that may very well give you an entree into that. You may in fact be the, the, the missing uh, link as an heir that they've been looking for to give authorization to, to uh, digitize those things and make them available. That's a great point. Well, um, what uh, do you do? You go to conventions, and if so what's uh, next one you're going to be at, where people can see it? Yeah, I go. I go to conventions and conferences, and and, and I enjoy them very much. Uh, I get to meet new people. I get to spend time with people I've known for a long time. But I, I also get to to attend sessions that maybe I've never never looked at before. <laughs> uh, uh, we've got, uh, I've got here in Florida in the next few weeks, I've got, uh, uh, I'm doing a, con a conference for the Ohio, the Florida chapter of the Ohio Genealogical Society. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're doing several sessions for them. And uh, uh, I've got uh, two other small things to do. And then, But then coming up in April, we're headed to Columbus for the Ohio Genealogical Conference and the Ohio Genealogical Society. I would venture to say, from of of all the state conferences I've ever attended, theirs is about the best organized. Really? Oh, they've cool. got some great people working on it. And uh, one of the things that I particularly enjoy uh, at that con conference too is there really is something for everyone. Uh, and they keep trying to expand the horizons. This year's conference, they will have uh, some Hispanic sessions, uh, and those are being delivered by Colleen Green from California. Mm -hmm. And those will be excellent, I'm sure. Um, uh, people like Deborah Abbott and Ari Wilkins and Janice Forte and, and, and others uh, will be giving African-American sessions. One of my favorite things at that conference is the African American Roundtable, and it's never long enough. It, it in years past, it's been an hour long, and uh, people people say, "Well, why are you going to the African American uh, Roundtable? Do you have African American ancestors?" Well, I know for a fact that I have a couple of African American cousins, um, right. but on the other hand. I go back into, I go into the session and it's not just a methodology for finding black ancestors. It's not looking plantation records. It's a whole body of methodology of how to find people pre-Civil War, 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly get lost trying to find, uh, if you look at those uh, 1790 through uh, 1840 censuses, uh, what's the name of your, your female ancestor? There's <laughs> nothing there unless she was a widow. Yeah. And, uh, but there, there are lots of resources that, that you learn about. But um, Mark Lowe will be there, Deb Abbott, just all, and, and I'll be there, Drew will be there. We'll, uh, but a lot of people, I, my guess is there were about 70 people last year. There will be more this year. They've expanded the length of the session. I think they've doubled this, uh, the length of it. Mm-hmm. And you, pe- people in there with, with various research projects, uh, people writing bi- biographical novels they were there and they were looking for resources on this person or that person and uh and the whole shared body of knowledge people going back and forth uh we had uh, one person in in last year's session who was who wasn't able to find uh an ancestor in uh, they found him in the, in an 1870 census but not in 1880 and so while other people were talking. Drew is sitting beside me, and he's on his iPad, and he's looking it up, and he raises his hand, and he said, I found them. <laughs> and so we started sharing, and they started sharing information back and forth. Within about five minutes, she had picked up all of her stuff and brought it over and popped <laughs> down, and she and Drew were collaborating for the next hour. <laughs> but, but you meet people who know things that you don't know, and uh, – uh, that's that's a wonderful thing about a conference in the first place is, is being able to make those connections and and finding you do have things in common or that you learn from other people. Um, anybody who goes to a conference, I, I tell them work the vendor hall, mm-hmm. work the vendor hall, talk to the the booksellers, talk to the societies, talk to different people. Um, they don't bring their whole inventory of books with them, but. You know, certainly talk to them and ask them if they have any suggestions for you. You'd be right. surprised the, uh, the 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 good advice they can give you. <laughs> George, this has been a great, great interview, and I can't thank you enough for sitting down and talking with me. Oh, this is great. Before we I wish go- we had more time to sit down and, and, and visit on a regular basis. I, I, I need to move to Florida. <laughs> We've got some family members down there, so we may just do that. Good. We have some family in uh, Sarasota and down in Miami, too. Fine. We were in Sarasota last weekend. They've got yeah. a great genealogy society there. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So where can people find you on the web? I've got they, links in the, the description, but go ahead and just tell us. Yep, they can find me on – well, certainly they can always find me on Facebook, but uh, you can you can find AHA Seminars on the web at – aha seminars.com that's a h a seminars.com and you're uh, on facebook as well yeah and uh we talked about your genealogy podcast and uh, you can find that all over the web but uh cool well before we go george is there anything else you want to you want to say i think i think the interviews that you're doing you're you're doing a lot to to encourage people to to do more and more research and diversify their approach to their research. And I think that's really great. And we need to bring certainly uh, younger researchers into the, into the fold, get them started. Um, one of the things I find uh, uh, so upsetting at, at conferences is that uh, I'll, I'll, a lot of the attendees are, are reluctant to approach speakers. Mm. They think, oh, there are some rock stars. <laughs> we're the same as they are. We're doing the same things they are. We're, and and uh, we're having fun with it, and we're getting frustrated at, at brick walls, too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, <laughs> you, had just you had mentioned that to just a, a, a listener in your podcast had helped out, helped a brick wall for you. Uh, and, and you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> This has been fun. I've really enjoyed this. Good. Well, I, I have too. And uh, I, I will take you up on your offer. And uh, I don't think it'll take much to drag my wife down and uh, hang out with you guys. In no. no, she's great. Well, thanks You're again, George. 
Thank you. Oh, I, I know. Don't touch. Um, I married up. <laughs> 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 I think it's just my personality, and that's that's all I've got, really. <laughs> you got a lot more. Well, George, again, thank you very much. And, thank you. Uh, well, next week, guys, um, set your reminders because we've got another Morgan that we're interviewing. I'm interviewing, uh, and we're going to get to know James Morgan the Third. He's a fellow Next Gener, just like uh, Drew, and uh, he's actually a Freemason and graduated from Howard University. So I'm really excited to sit down and talk to him. It'll be next Monday, the 19th, same bat time, same bat place at seven o'clock Central. Uh, look for it around the Twitters and around the Facebooks and on the blog, and uh, we'll make we'll spread it everywhere. So, guys, thanks again for tuning in, and all of you guys in the live chat. This was fantastic. Thank you for your your questions and just a great, lively conversation going on there. So, until next time, I'm Eric Wells, um, the Next Gen Genealogy Network Education Coordinator, and my own company, Legacy Left Right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.